How did Jesus treat people? If Jesus had been sexist, racist, if Jesus had been a hypocrite, a manipulator, I would not believe in him. I think you'd be a fool to believe in him. But the historical evidence is he taught an incredibly high ethical standard, and then he consistently lived up to that high ethical standard in a way that I'm jealous. I've tried to do that. And repeatedly, I have failed. And I only met one student who claimed to be morally perfect. He was a student at MIT. And in this dorm lounge at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he says, oh, I've lived a perfect life. Everybody in that lounge burst into laughter. I had to suppress my own smile. What a joke. What an absolute joke. But Jesus pulled it off. In John chapter 8, Jesus could look into the faces of his enemies and say, which one of you can prove me guilty of sin? And his enemies were silent. In 1 John chapter 3, John, who lived intimately with Christ for three years, could write about Jesus. In him is no sin. That demands my respect. I mean, I respect Gandhi. I respect Dr. Martin Luther King. I respect Abraham Lincoln. Why? These guys live lives of integrity. I got a truckload of respect for Mother Teresa. What an incredible woman of integrity. But Jesus was even better. That demands my respect. That is why for me to put my faith in Christ is a very wise decision. I am trying to rip apart the smoke screen that people put between themselves and Christ. In my afterlife, I'll worry about that later. This life right now, I'll worry about right now. I can't put my trust in something that was written 2,000 years ago. And a bunch of us are running away from God, are running away from Christ as fast as we can. You must save yourself. No one will do it for you. Maybe what you think you or I believe is the misinterpretation. Don't take it from me. Go to the source document, the Gospels, and read about Jesus for yourself. If you genuinely want to know Christ, he's not going to play hide and seek with you. You'll fight him. I don't think there's a conscience. I think we make moral standards dependent on our society that we live in. I'm not going to kill the other person just because we wouldn't really have a society, you know? We band together because we agree that we're not going to kill each other. That's the only reason I band together with this other guy is because we agreed we're not going to kill each other. So we start sending some other moral standards. And if you look, I mean, the wide variety of moral standards that exist across, across the world, it's really hard for me to believe that there's any some, you know, set conscious that is really, you know, guiding everyone. Okay, so think about your position on abortion, homosexuality, child abuse, battered wives. And what you have to acknowledge is that the opposite of your position is just as valid as yours. No. Sure you do. No. It's all relative. It is all relative, but well, I then think... the opposite position of yours is just as, rel as just as good and true as yours is. It is in that sense, but I think there is a certain moral standard which will help which you can create that'll make it the best moral standard for everyone to live the best. Oh, and who decides what's best for everybody? We got to figure that out. That's what the philosophers are working on. So talk we to trust the, the philosophers. Talk to the ethical philosophers. That's what they're working on. Oh, so we trust the ethical philosophers to make that decision. You got to, well, you got to trust someone to come up with, a, with, a, a, sure with an do. ethical standard to try to, get, to guide your life by. And then you got to ask yourself, what's in it for them? You better ask what's in it for them before you trust them. Well, yeah, if they made their ethical standard based around them being the monarch, I'd question that, yes. But it's clear out through the history of time that there's certain moral standards that sort of work. You know, like if I don't kill you, that seems to be working out pretty well. Like in general, if we don't lie, yeah, that seems to be working out pretty well. But yet, if like I had to lie to save my life, I'd be like, yeah, that's probably a pretty good idea. So then that moral standard just falls right flat on its face right there. So maybe lying is a good idea in some instances. And maybe killing is a really good idea in some other instances. If you're, whole, if there's a murderer in front of you and you're going to save your entire family or five thousand people, yeah, kill him. So basically, I don't see any, you know, I don't see any thing to believe that there's these set moral standards or a consciousness really guiding anyone's life. Which means, think of all your positions on all the important issues to you. Right. You have to acknowledge that the opposite position is just as accurate as yours. No. Sure you do. You're not being consistent then. No. It, it, if morality is relative, 
It means that all of the beliefs that I have are just as legitimate, just as correct, as all of the beliefs that are diametrically opposed to mine. Because morality is relative. Yeah, they are just as valid. I don't think there, I, I think there is some, there is a certain moral standard that will help each individual to leave the, certain moral standards infringe more on other people's lives. So what? Well, I just think in the context of all, all the people in the world, it'd be best if we had some moral standards that wouldn't infringe on everyone else's lives. That's your personal opinion. That is my personal opinion. Everyone has their personal opinion. And one is not more correct than another because it's all relative. Um, I was wrong. He's not free money. Right. Um, Thank you. So, it does not matter whether I feed him or whether I murder him. It is simply my decision. It's all relative. Yeah, it's your decision. I mean, yeah. It's how you want to live your life. And I get to judge that based on my moral standard. But your moral standards are not more correct than mine. We're not more correct than the Nazi German or than the white South African or whoever. Well, our moral standard does not uh, think that that's correct, no. Yeah, but if everything's relative the way you say it is, then it means one position is not better than another. It's all relative. And my point, no, obviously, I don't that think, I'm driving I don't away think, is you no, can't live that no, out. I know what you're saying. I you can't live it out. But you will stand here even, and tell even me, if, I'm a moral relativist, but if I push you hard enough, I will show you you can't live it out. It's impossible. Okay, you well, do let's not say, live as if the position opposite, whatever your position is, on wife abuse or abuse children, you are not willing to say the opposite position that I hold is just as valid as mine. Well, I can take the other position that there are set moral standards, but God still doesn't have to enter in the picture for me to do that either. If there's going to be a moral absolute, there's got to be some type of God to create and define that absolute. No, it doesn't. So you think, okay, let's say God creates and defines the absolute moral code, right? You're saying that he does, right? So God could have very well just decided that instead he could have decided that killing each other was going to be the moral standard. Since he decides on the moral code, couldn't he have decided on that? If God was a corrupt God, yes. Why would he be corrupt? God is, God, he can, he can, he decides the moral standard. Maybe he decided that was the right thing to do. Because in reality, the God who created us created a moral absolute that murder is wrong. Okay. So, because that's but the way I But he very well could have created I one that wasn't. I view a God who condones murder as being corrupt. But couldn't God very well have, in the beginning, created a moral code based around that killing's fine? If God was corrupt, yes. Well, that's only in light of the God. Who I am as a person in reality today. That's correct. That's how I live my life. But if God creates the moral standard, he has to create the moral standard based on some... If you, so you believe that, so you, don't, you think that's fine, that God could have created a... You think that's fine if God would have created a standard where everyone can kill them? I mean, everyone no, I can don't. kill each other? I don't. I would not worship God if God decreed that murder was good. Ooh. But you would have never known any difference. But right. yeah, you wouldn't have known any... Right. If I would have said this grass was always black, you'd never That's know correct. that it ever could have been green, so you never could have questioned it. Exactly. So, so you would have believed in God. Yeah. But you're no, thinking... You see, you see, what he's doing is, he's, he's trying to put me in such a theoretical situation. That's all we're I talking about. I can't answer it. It's because impossible to never, answer it. That's a good answer. Thank you. Now, saying, I appreciate that. Saying I wouldn't worship God if he said murder was okay, is to set yourself up as the judge of God. That's not a good answer. But to no. say that the saying that I would not worship God if he called me to murder is statement. I live in the here and the now with the conscience that God has given me, and living in the here and the now with the conscience God has given me, I know that murder's wrong. You can say these things happen. I can say, okay, the burden of proof is on you. It's not on us to say it didn't happen. The burden of proof is on you to say it did happen. Buddy, if Jesus Christ is the truth, there's no burden of proof on me. If Jesus Christ is the truth, your body is going to be hauled before him on a day of judgment, and you're going to have to answer to him. So let's not act like it's all burden is on me. You better go and do exactly what you recommended we all do. You better read the texts of the different major world religions, and you better come to an understanding what's reliable and what's not reliable. The Bible says that every word... The Bible says that every word in it is true. And you can you can come up here with your subjective, relativistic Christianity and faith in Christ, but the Bible says that you're going to be in hell with me. No. That's, what, that's what it says. No, it does not. Jesus clearly says that because I put my faith in him, I'm going to heaven. So why don't you put your faith in him and go to heaven with me? Because, I, you're right, there's nothing to lose. But that's not enough reason for me to believe in him. Okay, what would be enough? What would be enough? 
um, a burning bush, something that Moses saw, you know, um, a, a voice booming from the sky, an Old Testament type stuff. All right. My point to you, sir, is watch out that you don't tell God, God, if I'm going to believe in you, you got to give me a burning bush or a booming voice. So, why? What, what separates me from Moses? What's, I mean, why is Moses a lucky guy that, he, that, he, that the, burden isn't on, the burden's on me that it wasn't on Moses? Well, God has chosen to send his son Jesus to live a life that's perfect, to die and rise from the dead, and now he's saying, it's no burning bush, it's a dead man risen from the dead. That, that's fine for people that, that lived at the time of Jesus when um, they saw him on, on the, they saw him being crucified, and then three days later they saw the stone roll back and they saw Jesus alive again. But all I have is a text, a text. And, I, and I'm supposed to um, devote my life to a text because you say it so? And it's my understanding that you're paying an awful lot of money here to study some text. So I wouldn't want to minimize texts. It's the way you learn. It's the way you learn. Okay? So read the Gospels and learn about Jesus and ask yourself, does the evidence of how he lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead point to him being trustworthy or does it not? I'm right, I'm right now I'm in, I'm in physics 111, mechanics. And I mean, that, that'll tell me, that'll tell me that, that um, you know, I drop, a, I drop a, an eraser or a ball or something and it, it, I can calculate the time it's going to take. So I mean, there's justification in the text that I'm reading. I can, I can verify it in my own life by dropping it. Good. See that? Yeah, I see that. And so I'm saying that, so that I'm saying that why should I believe these things that happened 2,000 years ago? The, the burden of proof is I'm not supposed to come to the, the I'm not supposed to. The burden is not on me to to go in there and um. Yes, it and, is. And, 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 and the the it burden is, is on you to learn time. physics. The burden is on you to learn about Jesus. It's not my responsibility to do your homework for you, sir. You, you got to go why back. Are you are you, you got to study here physics. Here if, it's, if it's not your responsibility. It seems like you're taking some responsibility. I am taking the responsibility on my shoulders to point out to you, sir, that you need to read for yourself, not take it from me. You need to read the Gospels for yourself and ask yourself, does the historical evidence point to Jesus being reliable or does it not? Why Sorry? in a remote tribe has Christianity never developed? Like separate from, you know, why in a remote tribe has it not, like some guys, like four guys, they thought they heard Christ or God kind of spoke to them within them and they became Christians in some remote, remote tribe. There's no evidence that that's ever occurred. There's a lot of evidence that people who ha have been worshiping God and when they heard about Jesus, they looked the missionary right. in the face and said, what took you so long to get here? When they heard about Jesus, but all these guys in these, in, from a long time ago and still today, there's still, still some remote tribes, never did hear about Christ. Right. So they didn't, did they get the shaft? No. They will be judged uniquely based on the information they But nowhere they in had. the Bible does it say that if you, if you never knew God and if you never knew of Christ, that you still get in. Abraham meets a man named Melchizedek. But I, Abraham knew of God and the God that you were speaking of. But these guys in these remote tribes never knew of God or the God you're speaking of. When Abraham met Melchizedek, Abraham was so impressed with Melchizedek's knowledge of God that he adopted Melchizedek's name for God in his own names of God. Abraham had never met Melchizedek. Melchizedek had never been exposed to him. But obviously, God revealed himself to Melchizedek in a unique way. And Abraham sensed that and responded. He even tithed to Melchizedek. You don't have to fear that God doesn't love everybody and that God doesn't reveal himself to everybody. He does. But if he reveals himself to ev everyone, then why in the various remote tribes, like I said before, has it never developed independently? Did all those guys reject him? Or otherwise, you would think that at some point, one of those guys would have decided to believe in Christ and started some sort of gospel apart from its base source. Or its well, they obviously never heard about the historical Jesus. So that's why they didn't know the word Christ. No, I know, but they, there's never even a similar God that's developed in... A, oh, yes, in it's a, very similar. Not, not, not very similar, no. So similar that Abraham adopted Melchizedek's name for God. That's how similar it was. Abraham, after talking to Melchizedek, said, Buddy... You really do know God. Someone leads a sinless life. That demands incredible respect from us. I've only met one student in 20 years of speaking on campuses who claimed to be perfect. He was a student at MIT. He raised his hand and said, I've never sinned, I'm perfect. Everybody erupted into laughter in the dorm lounge. But Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. That's amazing. Something's going on here. 
Secondly, you read the teachings of Jesus. And gosh, those teachings have the ring of truth. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to the other also. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Those are not the teachings of a lunatic. They have the ring of truth. Thirdly, watch the way he dies. At the moment of his most excruciating pain, nailed to a wooden crossbeam, instead of cursing his enemies, he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Incredible sanity that flows from his face at the moment of his most excruciating pain. But fourthly, and most importantly, three days after he died, he physically, bodily rose from the dead. And over a period of 40 days, he appears to over 500 people who see him risen from the dead. Now, sir, if you die and rise from the dead after living a sinless life, I promise you, I will listen very, very closely to everything you have to say. But that wouldn't make me a god. My physical resuscitation after three days has very little to do with being the Logos that was at the beginning. If you are dead, stone dead, and if you rise from the dead, that gives your claim, whatever your claim is, a tremendous credibility. Wouldn't you have to agree with that? No, I'm not sure I would have to agree with that. I would say, okay, somebody physically was revived from death. Pretty amazing. Does that make this person God? No. Well, sir, he wasn't revived. He was in a tomb, a dank, damp, dark tomb, stone rolled in front. There wasn't a bunch of medical experts in there seeking how they could resuscitate him. He was dead. Three days after he died, he rose from the dead. I mean, that blows me out of the water. Because I perform a lot of funerals. I'm a minister. And when that body's dead, it ain't coming back. At least that's my experience. We'll say the same about Dionysus. Torn to pieces and restored. You can run all your tests on the Homeric pantheon and say, yeah, we should believe in those guys. No, that's mythology. It's not historical narrative. Why isn't Christian mythology mythology? I just went over that with you. The Greek mythologies, you apply my four tests, and they flunk when it comes to historicity. And if you compare Muhammad to Zeus, I think you're out to lunch. Muhammad is not a mythological figure. Muhammad was a real space-time individual. And Muslims didn't make up Muhammad. Muhammad really lived. Similarly, Christians didn't make up Jesus. He was a real space-time person. Now, if the guy really died and rose from the dead, man, you guys got to check him out. How come all the professors of history don't say this is the historical truth? Believe in the one true God, Jesus Christ. They know how to verify these things better than we do. Fine. That's simple. If you have a presupposition that there is no supernatural God, then it is obviously impossible for the dead Christ to rise from the dead. It's ludicrous. It's irrational. It is stupid. If there is no supernatural God, then obviously Jesus did not rise from the dead. Miracles don't happen, and dead people don't come alive again. But if you allow for the possibility of a supernatural God, then it's totally possible that someone would rise from the dead. But if you're so locked into your presupposition, there is no supernatural God, then when you hear about a resurrection, you automatically write that off. It's impossible. It's ludicrous. Yes. Can you talk a little about the order of the resurrection? Also, uh, the place of the tribulation martyrs in the whole scheme of things. Are, do, are they a part of the church? Or are they not a part of the church? Okay, I, I can't answer your second question. I don't know. In answer to your first question, first of all, I have to ascertain, did Jesus really die? Yes. And in the Gospel of John, we read that a Roman soldier looked into the face of Christ and said, the dude is dead. But just to make sure, he took a spear, jammed it into the side of Christ, and John records how watery serum, separate from clotting blood, flowed from his side. They did not understand that medically in the first century, but we understand medically today that if you cut yourself and watery serum flows out separate from clotting blood, you've not been sucking wind in the fast past five minutes. You are dead. Massive heart failure, clotting of the arteries, a separation of the watery serum from the clotted blood. The reason that's important is I need to ascertain, did Jesus just resuscitate in the tomb, or was he really dead and did he really resurrect? 
he was clearly dead on the cross. His body was taken off the cross, anointed with 90 to 120 pounds of burial ointment, as was the custom of the day, wrapped in white linen, put in a tomb, a stone was rolled in front of the tomb, and a Roman guard was set to make sure there'd be no hanky-panky, no stealing the dead body. Three days after he's put in that tomb, he appears to his courageous disciples. False. He appears to the wimps, the total wimps, called his disciples, his apostles. They're such wimps that when Christ was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, they all turned tail and ran. One of his 12 closest followers betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. His bravest follower, Peter, denied knowing him three times. These Jewish people were not sitting back in their rooms, putting together a resurrection myth. They were scared spitless. They were running for their lives. They did not expect to see Jesus again. No expectations. In fact, when the women who saw Jesus risen from the dead went and told those male chauvinists that Jesus had risen from the dead, they thought the women were crazy, were off their rockers. They were not expecting to see Jesus. But repeatedly, over a period of 40 days, Christ appeared to those people at different times, in different places, risen from the dead. And those wimps, those cowards, after they saw Jesus risen from the dead, suddenly became courageous men and women who were willing to die for what they had seen, the dead Christ risen from the dead. People will not die for a known lie. And if those apostles lied that they saw Christ risen from the dead, they never would have been willing to die for what they had created, a known lie. The evidence is Jesus really died. The evidence is Jesus really rose from the dead. That's why faith in Christ is not blind faith. It is not irrational faith. Faith in Christ is based on evidence. The evidence takes me so far and stops and then I have to trust Christ and depend upon him for eternal life. You want me to put my faith into a book that was interpreted and reinterpreted and held across the ages and passed down by word of mouth for how many hundreds of years? By how many different people? And it was translated probably wrongly into how many different languages? I'm supposed to put my faith into a book like that. Okay, where did you get that information? What, the fact that it was passed down by word of mouth? Yeah. I was raised Catholic. 13 years ago. Yes, ma'am? That's where I got my information. Okay. I was raised Protestant. And to be, tell you the truth, ma'am, there's a lot of problems in both Protestantism and Catholicism. You got to try to put away the Protestantism and the Catholicism. And you got to go to the source document for yourself, the New Testament Gospels. Which one? King James, New American, what? They're different. The only reason that the King James and the New American Standard are different is because the King James was translated from Greek and Hebrew into the English spoken on the streets of London, England in the 1600s. That's why there's all the thee and the thous. But when was the last time at the University of Illinois that someone came up to you and said, how art thou today? So that's why the New American Standard is translated from the same Hebrew and Greek, but it's translated into the English that we speak today in Champaign-Urbana not the English that was spoken in the 1600s. There's no contradiction between the King James and the New American Standard Version. It's different English, because it's different English spoken today from the 1600s. Cliff, why was it necessary that there be a Redeemer to begin with, and why was it necessary that it be Jesus Christ and nobody or nothing else? All right. Jesus Christ analyzed the human dilemma as being a sin problem. In other words, at the root of my being, I am warped. In other words, God has given me legitimate gifts, like a tongue. But he gave me my tongue to encourage people, to build people up. I have used a legitimate tongue in an illegitimate way. I have slandered, I have sliced and diced people, and that is evil. God gave me a sex drive to enjoy sex within marriage. I have taken that sex drive and I have lost it. I have used a woman in my head as a sex object to get a thrill. That is illegitimate. God has given me a hand 
a hand to help love and serve people, but instead I have slapped someone and hurt them. That's evil. How do you know it's evil? Two ways. First of all, my conscience tells me it's evil. I experience guilt after doing that. And secondly, when I compare my conscience to what Jesus revealed as being moral absolutes, I know that I'm guilty. Now, the wages, the consequence, the ramification of my sin is not a bad day. The ramification, the consequence, the wages of my sin is death and hell. Sin is fatal. I deserve death and hell. Jesus Christ is God stepping into space and time. Jesus lived a perfect sinless life, and then he bled and died on a cross for no sin of his own. He never committed a sin. But as God in human form, who lived a sinless life, he laid down his life as a perfect sacrifice, absorbing in his body the penalty that we deserve for our sin, for our wrongdoing, thereby offering us the option of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not God looking me in the face or looking Adolf Hitler in the face, shrugging his shoulders and saying, ah, oh, Nazis will be Nazis and boys will be boys. And red-blooded American Midwestern guys will be red-blooded American Midwestern guys. We'll just sweep it all under the rug. Forget about it. That's not forgiveness. That's excusing. Jesus Christ went through the hell of the cross to pay the hell that we deserve for our cosmic treason. Uh, do you believe men and women are equal, sir? Do you? Oh, uh, yes. Why? Definitely. Why are men and women equal? We are different, but we are equal just for the fact that we are all human beings and men have just as much right to uh, whatever as women. Why? 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 What do you mean, rights? What, what is a right? Who gives rights to men and women? Who give rights to men and women? Yeah. Sir, I think it's a matter of action. Action? What does that well, mean? Well, like rights. Men in our society, well, it's not in all societies, but in like, especially in our society, that men and women have uh, basically similar rights to do as they please. Like in certain societies, women are not allowed to uncover their face. In so, uh, certain societies, women are not allowed to go shopping alone, whatever. But yeah. now, as our society progressed and man has become smarter uh -huh. and more evolved, we have realized that there are no major differences in our minds between men and women. There are definitely physical differences, but there are not uh, mental capacity differences. So what I hear you saying is, society gives women their rights, society gives men their rights. Your value, your rights as a human being, depend upon what society chooses to give you. That's what I hear you saying. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. In a sense, yeah. Yeah. I think that's scary. Really scary. So Nazi society says, you Jews, ha, too bad. American society, Dred Scott decision, you black folks, three-fifths of value white folks. Sir, you didn't and that's question. what society says, so that's reality. Do you see what an incredibly superficial basis for an understanding of human rights, human dignity? But you're right. If there is no God, human beings don't have an innate intrinsic value. We're accidental collocations of atoms. That's all we are. Evolved to a higher order. We don't have any value. We don't have any innate significance or dignity. It's humanism. What's humanism? It's uh, just kind of basically a theory of the born in, that was born into uh, the human body, how we respect each other. If men and uh, women are equal, that yes, certain men will kill, certain women might go nuts. But in general, uh, people have learned and are born with a certain intuition not to do harm to each other. We have like a uh, founded guilt in our conscience. We have our conscious, our subconscious and whatnot. It's not even a matter of that we have to be taught these principles, that it's something that we're born with. Good. So there's something beyond society. You Instinct. just said it. We're something we're born Instinct. with. Instinct. As animals have. Oh, really? All men are as high How forms of animals. How on earth do you know what your dog feels about your value as a human being? <laughs> I'm not saying that dogs are that intelligent to have value about our human beings. I'm saying that all we are is a more complex animal with higher uh, emotions, higher level of emotions, higher level of feelings. Sir, but not so. If there is no God, you're up a creek without a paddle when it comes to explaining to me why human beings have value. 
why women have equal value as men, why men have value. It's the whole humanitarian theory, sir. Yeah, good, well put. It's just a theory. It's just a blind, arrogant human prejudice. That's I have value. Got, too. Well, why, Cliff? Why do you have value? Because I say I have value. Oh, that's wonderful, Cliff. But would you please explain to me why you have value as a human being? Well, obviously, because I give myself value. Oh, that's wonderful, Cliff. Why don't you wake up and smell the coffee? You're a hunk of primordial slime evolved to a higher order. You don't have value, Cliff. You're a cheap joke. Your number came up in a Monte Carlo game. And by evolution, you accidentally appeared here. So to try and argue that you have value is an exercise in futility. Sir, it's better than having somebody, it's better than having somebody uh, say that, hey, this is why you have values. You have these values because I tell you you have these values. You are here because I made you out of clay. You are here because my, your forefathers and ancestors inbred to have kids. And that's why our society is here. Do, do you, which uh, explanation do you prefer? Somebody telling you to have these values and somebody that tells you that, yeah, the only reason why this civilization and all these people around here is because of incest? No, I'll tell you why I'm convinced you have value. Because you're not an accident. You're a human being created by an intelligent mind for a purpose. And because you have purpose, you have value. If there is no purpose to life, then there is no significance to life. There is no value. Because if there is no purpose to life, it doesn't matter whether I love her or whether I rape her. It doesn't matter whether I murder him or whether I buy his lunch. It's that, all ultimately meaningless. And Camus and Sartre and Nietzsche had the courage to face the meaninglessness, the insignificance of life if there is no God. It's that simple. Sir, there but is you are whistling Dixie life. in the face of despair. You're saying, oh no, we all have value. No, sir, we don't. If there is no God, we don't have value. Let's okay. face reality. Let's not hide behind some lie. Oh, I think I'll, I'll give myself value today because it makes me feel better. I'll have a better day. So in order to have value, you have to have a purpose. In order for there to be an eight human value, there has to be a God who created us for a purpose. That's correct. So what you're saying is that monkeys do not have a purpose or any other life form. They have a purpose. They reproduce. They feed themselves. They live on. That's well, I'm their purpose if there is in life. No God, but that's monkeys their purpose. are just as big an accident as you and I are. So hold on, but also, if there is no God and whatnot, then why don't monkeys just all kill themselves so there'd be more food? I have never had a very cogent conversation with a monkey, so I can't tell you why monkeys do no. what they do. All right. No, but, all I can do is tell you what human, be what I learned from human beings as a result question, of having a conversation sir. with them. I've never had a good, intelligent conversation but with that's a monkey. But that's avoiding the question. No, the it's not. Concept. It's answering you head to head. You ask me why monkeys don't do a certain thing. I don't know why monkeys don't do a certain thing. I've never asked them. I've never had a good answer from them. I can tell you why certain people are con contemplating suicide because I work with them. I can tell you why people have abused their wives because I work with them and we talk about it. But I don't know why monkeys do what they do. I've never had a good conversation with one monkey. So you feel that Nietzsche had all the answers? No. I think that Nietzsche had the courage and the guts to face the logical conclusions of his agnosticism, his atheism, in a way that few people do. And I respect Nietzsche for having that courage. Sure. I have very little intellectual respect for a person who stands out here and says, well, there is no God, but we're all going to give ourselves meaning and value. Why? So we can feel good about ourselves. So we can argue that women have just as much value as man. Well, why does man have value? Why does woman have value? If there is no God, there's no value to a man. There's no value to a woman. We're all hunks of primordial slime evolved to higher order. Nietzsche faced that. That's what I respect in Nietzsche. How could you respect any, anything or accept any validity knowing that Nietzsche lost his mind? He was insane. Yeah, he also was brilliant before he lost his mind. So how could you accept anything he says from a man that's crazy? I, I, I listen to the man. thinking of a person. And if a person begins with a presupposition, there is no God, and if they follow it to its logical conclusion, life is trash, I got a lot of respect for them. I got far more respect than for, I have for a person who says, there is no God, but we're all valuable. There is no God, but women and men have equal value. What are you talking about, value? If there is no God, there's no such thing as human value. We just happened, man. Your number came up in a Monte Carlo game, so did mine. We're here by accident. There's no value. We just happen. It's all a crapshoot. That's all it is. But Why then, are you so bitter? Bitter? I'm not bitter. I'm real proud of Nietzsche 
for facing the logical consequences of his atheism. And I'm trying to drive you folks to realize that Nietzsche was right. And then I'm trying to obviously get you to consider the alternative, which is theism, that there is a God who really loves you, who created you for a purpose. I would say I was born a Muslim and I lived to the age of nine. And then at nine, I was introduced to what Christ I came to America to go to school and I was introduced to what Christianity was. But then at that point in time, uh, I still chose to practice my own religion my, that my parents put upon me and then came back home and never choose to, to convert over to Christianity. Right. I was surely introduced to it and heard about it and maybe even somebody like you had to speak with me and told me that I should do my life, live my life in this order, this fashion if I want to go to heaven. But I chose not to believe in you and chose to go back home and keep practicing the religion that I was born with. Does that mean that I'm going to hell? Okay, there are two parts of my answer. The first part is I'm trying to dynamite out of the water for you as quick as I can, the idea of Christianity. The Pope, you mentioned the Pope, it's because well, what you said, like the Pope, right. okay? <laughs> Sir, there is a big difference between Christianity. The Christian way, I'm sorry. Not Christianity, live my life the Christ by, the, by the way of Christ. Let's not say Christianity. Okay, good, I like it, but it's still not enough. <laughs> I have a lot of atheist friends who live the Christian way. Meaning by that, I, I ask them, how do you live? And they say, well, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right. Sounds pretty good to me. It comes right from Jesus. But she's the atheist living that way here in the United States. My neighbor does. All right? So the issue is putting my faith in Jesus Christ, which means Jesus I'm trusting that your God in human form come to rescue me from sin and death and hell by bleeding and dying on a cross from my sin. And I ask you, Jesus, not the church, not the Pope, not whoever, a priest or minister. I ask you, Jesus, for forgiveness. And I put my faith not in an institution or a cultural system. I put my faith in you, Christ. And then as a result of that faith, the lifestyle will follow. Which means if, if I stand out here and say, sir, I'm a follower of Christ, I put my faith in Christ, and after I'm finished, you watch me go out and womanize, you better point your finger in my face and say, Cliff, you are one hypocrite. You say you believe in Jesus. Look what you're doing with your life. There's a contradiction here, Cliff. Okay, so faith is not just intellectually I believe. It's a deep loyalty in Jesus Christ that'll be shown in a lifestyle of obedience. Obviously, sir, what I'm trying to point out is, how can someone say, I believe in Jesus, and then enslave African Americans? We got a problem here. Of course. Right? I mean, that's we got a major problem here. That is a major problem in the Western world. But. Right. We got a major problem with the idea, I believe in Jesus, and now I'm going to go out and hate you. I believe in Jesus, and I'm going to go out and womanize. I believe in Jesus, and I'm going to go out and intentionally live in sin. There's a problem here. I'm not going to heaven because I live a good life. I'm going to heaven because Christ bled and died on a cross for me. But when I put my faith in him, my lifestyle changes as I submit to Jesus as Lord. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say put your faith in Christ. Now, Jesus communicated, here's the second part of my answer, which I hopefully gets right to your question. Anybody who hears about him, not about Western Christianity, but about Jesus Christ, anybody who has the opportunity to get to know Christ and rejects Christ, Jesus clearly says, you're rejecting God, you're choosing to live your life separate from God, you will go to hell unequivocally. The difficult question this gentleman asked is, well, what about those people who don't have the opportunity to hear about Christ? How is God going to judge them? Or let's say they just hear about the Pope out there in Rome somewhere. See, I don't know how God's going to judge that person because Jesus never nailed it. <laughs> he never specifically answers that one. So for me to stand here and say this is what he's going to do would be presumptuous because he doesn't say. And all I am out here is Jesus' mailman. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. I read what Jesus said, and I'm communicating it as clearly as I can to you. So unequivocally, Jesus says, you hear about me and reject me, you are going straight to hell because you've sinned, you've done wrong, you reject my death on the cross for your sin, you'll have to pay for your own sin. You're choosing to live your life separate from me, you'll go to hell.